Um, I'm Hussein Karimboy. I'm the uh, programmer here at DocFest. I forgot what I was. Can you believe that? Um, I'm the programmer at DocFest, and I want to welcome you all today to um, uh, the premiere of a, a great film called The House I Live In by Eugene Jarecki, uh, one of the most, uh, I think, intellectual and uh, independently spirited auteurs in documentary in the United States. Um, he can't be here today for the Q&A in the flesh, but we have something a bit better for you. Uh, all the way from New York City, uh, the producer of the film flew in like an hour ago to be here with you. Uh, welcome to the stage, please, Christopher St. John. I'm not sure I'm better. I'm not going <laughs> to go out there. But uh, hello. Eugene, I think, is actually going to join us via the interweb after the, after the show. Um, we are incredibly happy to be here at, at uh, Sheffield DocFest, and I'm not going to say much about it now. I think the film speaks for itself, other than to say that this movie really deals with some of the foremost issues that we think the United States is facing in terms of social justice and human rights, and probably by extension the UK and the world as well. And um, in many ways, it's a deeply personal film for Eugene and the rest of us. And um, I hope you enjoy it. We'll see you afterwards. So um, there will be a Skype Q&A afterwards with the producer and Eugene. So please stick around. Uh, don't forget to vote with your audience slips. Your votes can mean a new life for a film afterwards after the festival. And uh, uh, turn off your phones. Thanks. From a, from a British audience, how much are the Americans actually aware of the issues raised in this film? Uh, well, that actually has a, a pretty complicated answer because on one level, I would say that Americans are aware of, of almost everything in the film. Um, we are aware that we lock people up in record numbers. We're aware that drugs are illegal and are punished harshly, but we're not aware. The issue hasn't really been framed in a way where you see it as an entire picture um, and just how draconian it actually is. So what we were hoping to do with the film is, is reframe that issue, bring it back to the forefront, and rather than, than it settling into this place where it's, it's normal, um, it's, we're trying to bring it back to the forefront of the consciousness. But um, that is not something that people are very aware of. Like, the, the effect that the drug war has on people's lives and families and the kind of ripple effect it has throughout the country um, is definitely something that is not normally talked about, uh, but it is increasingly so. It's becoming a bit of a political issue these days. Certainly, the legalization of marijuana is bringing that to the forefront. Um, maybe to its detriment, that has become the face of the argument, because I think the argument is, is a lot larger than that. I think that that uh, that marijuana is, is an easy in, um, whether you think that it should be decriminalized, legalized, or not. Um, I think that issues of, I, as the movie says, issues of uh, sentencing and, and harsh penalties for drug crime of all, like, across the board are actually much, much more serious than, than just whether, you know, some college kid is getting busted for an ounce of weed. Um, but we are actually, we're, we're trying with this film to do something that we haven't done before with movies, and, and Eugene is, has had some very successful documentaries, and, and he, if he gets up on the screen, maybe he'll tell you yeah, about it. Yeah, is that it. easy? Um, hello, Eugene. <laughs> Hello? Okay. Let's <laughs> <hang> in. <laughs> Let's see. <clears throat> but uh, the truth is, is we're actually mounting a really aggressive outreach campaign ourselves as filmmakers because it got to the point where we were... Hi. Hello. Hey. Hello. Eugene. Yes. Hi, it's Kate from Storyville and Chris. How are you? I'm good. How are you guys? Good breakfast? Oh, okay. Uh, yes. Well, we've got an audience here. We haven't got long, Eugene. So um, uh, they've just watched the film. Chris is just beginning to talk about the outreach work, but maybe we should just throw it open to the audience first and if there are, um, see if there's any questions from the audience for Eugene. Okay. Terrific. And I'm happy to 
happy to answer a few, and, and Chris is also um, my absolute sort of partner in crime in this and can describe a great deal in detail for people and anything about the film, but I'd love to talk to you. Absolutely. First question from the audience, Eugene, coming up. Uh, hi, Eugene. First of all, it was a fantastic film, very, um, very moving, very interesting. I wanted to ask what you thought um, the if there was any kind of divide in terms of political parties. I mean, if, if you look at uh, the war on drugs, it came under Nixon, and he said that it was, uh, he described it as a bipartisan issue, but do you think that there's a um, any kind of uh, unfairness between, is it a Republican issue more than a Democratic issue, or have Democratic presidents been uh, just as involved as the Republicans? I think the best way to look at that it's very much how uh, you need to look at so many aspects of American political life and social life is that a lot of us hold in our hearts a kind of a nostalgic illusion that the Democrats, because we remember seeing many of them in old footage of the civil rights movements and such things, that the Democrats in some way have a sort of greater moral edge on matters like this that you'll find and you certainly will occasionally find that in the Democratic Party, you'll have occasional people um, like Patrick Leahy or you know, you know, others, a uh, couple of few senators here or there, or mayors or governors, who will have spoken out uh, against the drug war. But um, as with so many other areas of American corruption, uh, it really does know no party lines. Um, it means that at the end of the day, I find all too often that the Democrats are in many ways wolves in sheep's clothing. I don't blame them particularly more than their Although there is something a little bit um, unsettling about being doubly deceived. A, that one should support policies that are fundamentally deceptive. And B, uh, then it comes in the advanced class, which is one should then pretend that one is highly moral in the matter. And I think uh, Bill Clinton certainly did more to escalate the drug war in the United States than Ronald Reagan. Um, Clinton is probably in the whole lineup. Um, the one who maybe because he wanted to prove how tough he was, or maybe because his soul is just the soul of a politician doing all the calculus about where his bread is buttered. Um, but at the end of the day, without making apologies for anyone, on paper, in fact, he's probably the most draconian. We certainly see the extraordinary destruction of the three strikes laws ushered in on his watch. So I would say this is a bipartisan problem. It has bipartisan uh, culpability. Um, and I look Chris will talk, tell you about this in our efforts in the outreach. I look in all directions right now to find partners in crime and getting uh, some meaningful reform. And the, the inspiring part there is we're finding support and we're finding there is a new kind of groundswell against the drug war that we can hopefully be some part of that is coming from a variety of directions as disparate as Ron Paul on the one hand, uh, on the one side, all the way to, you know, to Jay-Z on the other. I mean, the tremendous yeah. range of people, as Charles Ogletree says in the film, we've never had so many people on the same side of this issue. Police Commissioner Bratton, who we saw at the end of the film, is now coming out in, you know, in very strong ways about the need for meaningful reform of our approach to criminal justice. This is, guys, this guy is America's sheriff. You know? And I, I would just add to that that I think that what happened with uh, the parties and the, the drug war is that it was defined as a criminal issue and therefore it's not a partisan, tough on crime is not a partisan issue. So you have politics on, p politicians on both sides of the aisle considering being soft on crime as an absolute political loser, whether that's true or not. So it's, it's not something that people are arguing with one another about, unfortunately. Okay, next question coming up, Eugene. Just wanted to say thank you very much for showing the film. It's a fantastic piece of storytelling, great narrative. And it's really great to see that it being shown on British mainstream television. Where is it being shown in America, and what impact has that had? Well, it's, it's a great question. It's a question we are solving at the moment, and I think we're making some really good strides um, at, at finding a very creative uh, approach to bringing the film out. Uh, I have to say, I don't know if Nick Fraser is there, but you know, all my films, and I am no exception, there are many uh, American filmmakers and many world filmmakers like me, uh, have been incredibly blessed to get access to making our own films because they start at Storyville and because Nick Fraser makes it possible for us to get the running start that others then say, oh, I'll get on board also. So he, he and his, his team have this special brand of courage with these films, and so 
I have always had this sort of terrific outlet uh, in Britain, and yet uh, being here in America, it's much more of a struggle. Um, in this particular case, after the film was at Sundance, uh, we, you know, everyone said to me, oh, you won the grand jury prize, I bet the world is your oyster now. And the fact is, that's not really how it works. You know, it's still a very intense, very heavy, not, it's not exactly a feel-good film. Um, and that means that we will have a challenge in finding, and well, we, I want to say it actually much more optimistically, at that time it looked like, oh goodness, it's going to be really challenging to get it out there. What I've since discovered, and it's been extremely heartening, is that in the, say, five or six years since I was at Sundance with my film, Why We Fight, where in those days I felt very much in the wilderness. I made a film about a heavy issue, and I wanted to get it out there. And Sony picked up the film, and we're going to take it out. And I saw them do a very large release footprint. But nonetheless, it felt like we were showing it in a large, empty room all over the country. Like, you had this feeling of being very alone in the wilderness. There weren't lots of grassroots constituent groups helping me go after the military and industrial complex or stop the war effort. You know, I remember going to Britain and seeing the protest marches in Britain um, that made our protest marches look laughable and, and embarrassingly small. Um, however self-critical the British may have been about this, they, they were a model of war protest compared to the US. So when I put out that film, I found myself relatively alone. The opposite is true now. What Chris and I are discovering is that everywhere we go, we have the ACLU and the Drug Policy Alliance and pastors and churches and, and uh, celebrities and other groups who are just the thousands of grassroots. You know, the great things about America, and I, I do nothing but criticize America, it was seen in my films. The one thing you can say great about America is there's an insane um, phenomenon in American life, both of philanthropy, just economic philanthropy, which we do kind of more than anyone. And I'm not exactly sure if anyone's ever figured out why it's so much a part of our lives. Um, but that combines with a tremendous amount, and other people do do this part, a tremendous amount of grassroots energy on the ground. So we are finding that the way we're going to bring the film out is both theatrical, it's going to be coming out with the same distributor who brought out Exit from the Gift Shop, um, and Senna, two films that, that really had a terrific way of imprinting the American imagination. But while that commercial release is happening, and it also comes out on ITBS on public television, um, and we're also in dialogue with trying to also pursue other avenues in addition to that in television. Um, and then at the same time, in, in uh, all, the, all the sort of new populist uh, VOD and, and uh, day and day video on demand type approaches, so that at the end of the day, we have a commercial on one hand, but what Chris and I spend really 90% of our time on is uh, looking at where we can deploy the film in America to be socially relevant and impactful in a way that dovetails with the commercial release. And Chris can talk more about, and I guess he's probably started a little bit, this low-hanging fruit strategy that we have in, in states across the country. Uh, we haven't gotten there yet, but I'm well. I'm happy to yeah. go there. Uh, talk a little bit about it, Chris, so people can learn about it. Okay, so, so we've... Eugene tends to give this example of why we fight, which was this, he was showing it to empty theaters. He felt like, you know, we had the amazing distribution deal showing in markets across the country, remarkable for a, a kind of issue documentary, um, and yet there wasn't anybody going to see it. Um, and to a certain extent, he discovered that distributors don't have a line item for social change. And, you know, you make this documentary, you get all, amped up, you're going to change the world, you put it out there, leave it up to Jesus, and and it it kind of fizzles, because that's, to a certain extent, what happens if they're not deployed. Um, so what we're trying to do is we're putting aside our kind of filmmaker hats for a year or two, um, and really trying to aggressively deploy this movie. And that that comes is coming in a number of forms. One of them is the low-hanging fruit that Eugene is just mentioning, and that's happening on a state-by-state, -state, like a real local level. Um, there are initiatives across the country to change drug and sentencing laws, um, and even things that are kind of peripheral to the drug war that are just common sense changes um, and are really at a tipping point for passing into law or, or releasing people who have been sentenced to life for absurd crimes. Um, and we're deploying the movie very strategically in those places to help get those initiatives over the hump. For example, after Sundance, 
we were approached by Stanford Law School out in California because they are doing an initi initiative with three strikes, which is, I don't know how familiar you guys are with it here in, in England, maybe, maybe you have it too. I understand it's been branded around the world now. Um, but for three felony strikes in, the, in many states in the United States, you go to jail for life. And in California, it's especially draconian. The third strike can be incredibly petty. There are real cases of people going to jail for less than an ounce of marijuana for life, uh, stealing a piece of pizza for life. And these are not, these are not made up. Um, so this is a very sensible change. It would make that third strike have to be serious or violent. Um, and we have very robustly taken the film to California, rallied people around it. It looks like this initiative has an extremely good chance for um, actually passing. And it just happens to be the foremost of about a dozen various low-hanging fruits around the country we're working on, in addition to a more national campaign of, of basically bringing, bringing it into the forefront of people's minds, hopefully making it an issue as we come into this presidential campaign. Um, and basically pushing it from every angle possible. Um, and the kind of the third arm we're coming in through is the professional associations. As you saw on, in the movie, some of the most eloquent voices against the war on drugs or against some of the, the tactics of the war on drugs are people within the system, are Mike Carpenter, who is a tough on crime kind of guy, lock him up, and yet knows that something is abysmally wrong with the, the way we're doing things now. So we are showing the film at trade conventions, at uh, mayoral and judge conventions, the uh, American Bureau of Defense Attorneys. Um, and that's, that's less to convert anybody because we found that in many cases, people in these fields working in the system that is in many ways severely problematic are already converted. They just haven't realized that the water is warm and that there are people like them. And it's, it's more providing a rallying point um, for, for folks to, to come together. I want to add to one thing to that. Just, it does set the stage for how the film can infect conversation, I hope. Um, and you never know what impact your film has had. We're, trying to, we're really trying to also be a case study for ourselves in what happens when a team of people, instead of just making a film and then saying, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, we'll go on to the next subject now, which I have done some of in my life. Instead, what happens if you really get 100% of your energies devoted to the deployment of your film for a period of two years after you're done with it, at least, so that, and I've always worked my films very hard, but what we're doing now is on another order of magnitude, um, and, and makes us, you know, and sort of enables us to avail ourselves the tremendous actual armies that are out there for meaningful change. And we're, we're being told to wrap it up, Eugene, but uh, we are, we've, we've developed a wonderful network of strategic partnerships um, with people not in the film industry as well as, as in the film industry. Um, and we have a, a, a great plan <laughs> that we would love to share with anyone who wants to visit me after the after the screening and Q&A hey, here. Chris, Chris, can you find out, can you ask them whether I could ask the audience one simple question about this? Yes, you are getting the go-ahead. Uh, I'm just curious, with, like with a show of hands, how many people in the audience supported the film and said, I'm looking at something that's about America and the unique trouble of America, versus how many people saw it and thought it had implications living, living where they live, whether in Britain or elsewhere? Um, so a show of hands of how many people who really looked at it as America-centric and a distinct problem of America um, and didn't see it as something about their own world. No hands. So and, and hands for people who thought, as it goes in America, this has implications for me where I live? Hands for wider implications. Uh, okay. uh, 90%. That's interesting. Okay. Okay. You can all rest assured. <clears throat> Eugene, thanks so much. And the best of luck with the outreach, and we'll all be behind you. Bye-bye.